And I would like to, uh, uh, to just stop here and go and, and ask uh, Moshe to come and tell us about uh, DNA uh, methylation, diagnostic Thank and you. implication. Thank you so much for the kind invitation. Uh, it's my third uh, workshop. I was in the first workshop, and since I believe you remember everything I said in the first workshop, I, will, I wanted to check where I stopped in the first workshop so I can continue uh, today. And uh, I love the fact that uh, we're going to talk about diagnostic and uh, therapeutic implications of the fundamental theoretical understanding of epigenetics. So I would like to go first into the theoretical understanding, which I think should drive uh, our understanding of diagnosis. So in the first meeting many years ago, when was it, four years ago, three years ago, I presented our work on the importance of the interaction between the mother and the child in shaping the epigenome of the child. And posing the question of how uh, nurture and nature interact. And we'll, we'll start with this basic idea to go on and say that now we know that uh, the social interactions are critical, the economic interactions are critical, and the physical interactions are critical in shaping the way the DNA is programmed. And of course, uh, epigenetics includes everything we know and we don't know, but I will focus on the way the DNA itself is marked. And what makes DNA methylation and the further downstream modification so fascinating is that the same molecule, the same chemical molecule called DNA, has two layers of information. One layer is the genetic ancestral information, and the second one is the way the DNA is marked. And this is a covalent part of the DNA. This stays with the DNA in the tomb, in the graveyard. You can dig it out after 30,000 years, and you can actually sequence that and find out the epigenetic profile which you can't do with the microRNAs, the chromatin, or all the other stuff that is around. They're very important. But this is within the DNA itself, within the same molecule. And so we will talk about how all of this can guide us into understanding disease and understanding uh, health and how it impacts um, both uh, diagnosis and therapeutics. So just as a reminder, this fascinating addition to DNA, uh, which was created very, very early in evolution, almost all bacteria have DNA methylation. So two things, three things had to be created at the same time, or not at the same time, but to create what we understand about DNA methylation. This, the enzymes that can transfer methyl group from s methionine to DNA had to be formed or evolved. S adenosyl methionine had to be evolved and the enzymes that synthesize S adenosyl methionine. And then the mechanism that recognizes this as different from that had to be evolved. So what, you, what this has added to the DNA is enormous flexibility. So now the same cytosine can mean different things. So you can inherit on one hand and it means one thing and then you can add the methyl group and it means a different thing. But to create that, you had to create three different systems, a system that makes the donor, a system that transfers the donor to the DNA, and then a system that reads it and understands that you are different. So in bacteria, it's the restriction modification enzymes that were able to recognize this from this and look at this and say, you are me and you are not me. So that adds also identity to the DNA. But what it does, it gives the gene a very different understanding. A gene could be either look like this or look like that. And most of it is formed during gestation, highly predictable. So we can take a gene from a Neanderthal and map the methylation and find out what tissue it comes from. So we can predict completely what tissue that DNA comes from based on the DNA methylation. Not only we can predict what tissue it comes, we can predict sub and sub cell types. So this is highly predictable. This is written in our DNA. It's, it's 
known what methylation we will get. So we have to understand that so probably 95, 99% of the pattern is defined by evolution, and we can't change very much of it. But at the same time, it's open to change. And what we learned in the last few years, so when I started my career, this was etched in stone. I learned from my teachers, and DNA methylation is a very, very old field. Actually, DNA methylation was discovered by Hotchkiss in 1948. Even before we understood how DNA is working, we already knew that DNA has more than four bases. So this is how old it is. But the idea was that all humans have the same DNA methylation pattern, and all fish from the same species will have the same DNA methylation pattern. And even mouse and humans have very similar DNA methylation patterns. And we never asked the question, what's beyond what we call development, which was the predicted developmental process? And now we introduce this concept that this DNA methylation pattern could be op open to signals. And these signals can come from different parts of the environment, which I would like to suggest is an integrated environment. You can't break down the social, the physical, and the chemical environment. They feed into this methylation pattern and tweak it. And that tweaking of the methylation pattern now increases the complexity of your genome. And I will argue was created not to cause disease, but to increase fitness and adaptation. So if we look at the gene as some sort of a steady state between the developmental process that defined most of what's going to happen, but the additional signals that feed into the gene uh, during, uh, during life, we can now start thinking about what happens early in life. We inherit a genome that is quite old. It changes a little um, from generation to generation. But it doesn't predict the DNA by itself. Uh, if we're going to be born in Ecuador or in Stockholm, if we're going to be born in a place where there's a lot of food or very little food, um, if we will go to have a lot of predators or no predators, uh, if my, our father is going to make $500 million a year or $5 a year, none of this is written in the genome. But they are very, very important for life. And so what I suggest that this integrated information that comes from the bioenvironment, which now we call the microbiome, but not just the microbiome, but all the animals around us, which send a very, very important information on the kind of world we're going to live in. The physical environment, which includes anything from food to climate to temperature uh, to housing, and the social environment, which is the other con species that we are going to deal with, in the case of humans, with other humans, all feed into signaling pathways that will tweak the genome. And this is very important because gen when geneticists go to epigenetics, they're looking for random changes, stochastic changes. And they're looking for a million people to map and to find those stochastic changes that have a statistical significance of more than 10 to the minus 12 and, a, and an effect size of 0.01. Uh, but, and that's true for genetics, because a lot of the changes in genetics are random. And sometimes they hit the place that is important. But here I think we're talking about a physiological process by which information is registered through pathways that evolution has created for us to interpret those in, 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 in information and to tweak the epigenome to create a phenotype that is a composite of the evolutionary inherited pheno uh, genome plus the, uh, the information, and that creates adaptation to the bioenvironment, physical environment, and social environment. So that's all good. This should not cause disease. It should give health. But misfit between that process and the world that is the real world, not the anticipated world, but the real world, can create health challenges. So we have to understand the epi, we don't have to, but we sh I would suggest that we understand the epigenome as a, as a prime physiological process to adapt the genome to anticipated needs that sometimes is found itself in the wrong places. We all know the Barker hypothesis, where nutrition early in life kind of predicts the kind of world, then McDonald will provide you calories for very cheap, so the entire system falls apart. 
because the prediction that poverty will lead to low calories is shattered by human evolution that created the possibility of selling McDonald's for one dollar and now this whole system is collapsing and poor people become obese which never happened in the history of humankind so this is a very good example and you can think about antibiotics which destroyed entire anticipation for uh, the immune system because now every mother washes her nipples and, and before she breastfeeds and washes her hands and the doctor uses soap. So the whole system which anticipates a certain situation is now countered by the way the human brain evolved to generate new challenges to the system and that creates health challenges. <clears throat> I, I will start with this story and we'll go from there. So monkeys are our best cousins in evolution. They're the closest to us. Uh, you don't need to be a genius or a psychologist to look at monkeys and to see how they resemble uh, your own department and uh, the hierarchies you see in your own department. And uh, one of the systems we were working for many years is with Steve Sumi, who is rearing his monkeys either with a mother or with a surrogate. So it's a very seemingly mild environmental intervention that causes huge phenotypic differences. So these monkeys evolved to, div to almost different creatures. And their differences are not just psychological differences. They be these guys become more sexually aggressive because they know they have very little chances to get sex. And if they don't um, get sex at the right moment, they will never get it and pass their genome. This guy is, uh, is relaxed. He knows that food and sex will always be available. And uh, so therefore, you have different phenotypic behavioral phenotypes. But this guy will develop alcoholism if we provide him alcohol. He will develop diabetes uh, and probably cancer at a much higher rate than the guys who develop with the mother. So we see again these three environments integrated. In that information, it comes from the fact I have or I don't have a real mother. And these monkeys get all the same calories, the same treatment. They have a very nice human nurse that takes care of them. And they're raised in a daycare, but they don't have the real mother. And they know that they didn't have a mother. So last time I presented this data, I think, uh, these are adult monkeys that were sacrificed in, uh, at adulthood. And we looked at T cells and prefrontal cortex methylation changes. So this is a full genome methylation mapping using MDIP and uh, zero in the case, no difference. And uh, these are the confidence intervals. And you can see those peaks of changes in DNA methylation across the genome. So this is another, um, another important concept that we'll learn, that the changes in epigenetics in response to environment don't hit one gene. They hit the system. It's a system change. And also we learn here that it doesn't happen in one tissue, like the target tissue, like if you lose a mother, you would think the tissue that would care about losing a mother should be, uh, I don't know, the uh, prefrontal cortex, the amygdala, the hippocampus. No, the immune system knows that you don't have a mother. But at that time, we didn't know how early it starts. When do we know that we don't have a mother? So because it's very hard to study longitudinal social epigenetics on the brain, because very few humans will donate their hippocampus in a longitudinal manner, and, um, and even in monkeys, you cannot take hippocampus whenever you want. They're not like rats. And so, uh, but once you will learn that the immune system is a good reporter of behavior, uh, we could now follow monkeys throughout life. The second important thing that we learned is that males and females are not the same. And it took me many years to realize that. And uh, because we always studied males, because for all of the different reasons, we studied males. So we followed here from birth uh, to uh, two years, which is uh, early adulthood in a monkey, uh, their methylation pattern, both in males and females. And the question we ask, we're always interested in disease or not having a mother. What is the normal evolution of the DNA methylation pattern? When I was a graduate student, we thought that you're born with a methylation pattern and you die with the same methylation pattern. And, and, uh, but, but that assumption might not be true, that things are happening. So the first thing we did is see how early the differences emerge. And already at 14 days, we could cluster the monkeys with the mother and the monkeys without the mother separately. And it's fascinating to me because I spent 20 years doing this in cancer and trying to separate cancer samples from normal samples. And I can do the same separating 
monkeys with a mother and monkeys without a mother, a week after they were separated from the mother, the immune system registers that difference in thousands of genes that I don't have a mother, and that means certain things to my immune system. And then we followed the uh, development. And we followed, this is day 14. Uh, so what we did here, you, you notice that the colors changed. Uh, the postdoc changed. And he doesn't like green and red. He likes blue and uh, red. I don't know why. Uh, but I, I, I'm loyal to the people who, uh, so I didn't change the color. So, but they, they mean the same. Red means more methylated. Blue means less methylated. And what we did here is compare the methylation pattern to the baseline. And the baseline was their methylation pattern at day 14. And you can see that before weaning and after weaning, there's dramatic changes in methylation because white means no changes in methylation. Blue means that the genes go down and red go up. And you can see the dramatic changes going on up to two years. The same in females. But what's more interesting is the difference between males and females. And you see that these differences appear very early in life, and they continue. It's one time where the differences disappear. This is weaning. And that was very interesting, because weaning is exactly what we do when we separate the mother, right? Weaning is when the animal loses the connection to the mother. And that's probably an enormously uh, stressful time in life. And at that point, the males and females look the same, because they change methylation in different directions. And then again, the differences between males and females emerge. These are huge differences. By the way, when I take a methylome and do an unsupervised clustering, right, without any bias, the first separation that I will get in my group will be males and females. Then I will see if they have cancer or not, if they, you know, they had a mother or not. But the first biggest difference in methylation is between males and females. And this is something I think that will affect the way we look at many things. So you can see how many genes, uh, you know, early on there's a huge change in methylation, uh, both in uh, females and males. The differences go down in females, but actually uh, go up in males when we add the maternal separation. So these are the difference between maternal separation. And here are, now we are Now we are subtracting the stressed, the maternally separated animals from the control animals. So these are differences on top of the developmental differences. And you can see the biggest differences early after birth, uh, both in males and females. You can see that uh, uh, the differences at the time of weaning disappear, again, because what is happening here by the intervention of removing the mother, we did what nature does normally, which is remove the mother when you are weaned uh, from your mother. So at that point, it seems that we did almost the same thing, and then the differences uh, appear again. So now we can ask a question. When the experimentalist removes the mother, or when an accident happens and you lose your mother when you're a young kid, and when you normally lose your mother when she weans you off, are you working on the same genes? And that's very important because it suggests that what's going on is not just bad things happen and the epigenome gets confused, it doesn't have a mother and doesn't know what to do, uh, but that essentially there are physiological pathways that sense you are moving your mother away. And what we do by the experiment or by what happens something in life is that we precociously do something that should happen in two years we do it, or in a monkey, excuse me, nine months, we do it now at birth. And you can see a huge overlap between the genes that are affected by just separating the mother artificially and the normal separation of the mother, but you see differences. It's not perfect. So if you separate the mother when you are seven days, it's not the same as separating a mother when you are nine months. It's almost the same, but not the same. And these differences will remain and probably will evolve a phenotype. So you can look at the pathways that, that are affected at day 14 and normal weaning. And what's the remarkable thing is that you get the, the usual suspects of pro-inflammatory pathways that are involved in many, many diseases. And there's almost common elements in all human disease and all human, and I'm sure it has to do 
this is a monkey, this is uh, um, uh, uh, and mice, and probably it's true for all animals, that pro-inflammatory pathways are involved probably in almost every human disease from behavioral uh, pathologies to cancer. And they all involve this response of the inflammatory system that seems to be activated normally when you lose a mother and also uh, when uh, you uh, wean in a very unnatural way. So how early does the animal know its social status. Um, you know, when you separate a mother, already the animal has an interaction. It recognizes that it doesn't have a mother, so there's a social interaction. So what I wanted to know is, does it develop even before you had any social interactions? You already know the social group that you belong to. So monkeys, like humans, develop hierarchical structures. And, I, I'm sure, and I, know, I know this is true for fish and for probably almost every animal that has some social interactions, that there is social dominance and hierarchies. And in rhesus monkeys, these are matrilineal social families, and every monkey in the group knows what family is the high status and low status. You can even show them pictures of the high status monkey, and they will bow to that monkey, to the picture. So they know. And so my colleague, Steve Sumi, says, you don't have to stress these animals. Just let's compare animals that were born to an upper class monkey and, and, uh, and monkeys that were born to a lower class monkey. They haven't seen any effects of class. They haven't seen anything. They're just coming out. We'll look at the placenta. What you can see is that when you compare high rank and low rank, a huge, clear difference between the placentas of the upper class and the placentas of the lower class, which also tells you the sensitivity of things that we don't consider as very important. This is not poison, this is not lead, this is just a social status. All these monkeys have access to the same amount of calories, they get the same kind of treatment, they're in the same cage, but they know who is upper and who is lower class. But here comes the interesting thing, where methylation can serve as an enormous diagnostic tool. Because DNA methylation, in comparison to any other thing, is an extremely stable mark. A bond between a metal group and a, and a cytosine ring is probably one of the strongest bonds in nature. Very hard to break. That, that is a different issue. And so you can use DNA to ask the question, what status was this animal born with or not? So what we did is a penalized regression on the thousands differences uh, between the status animals and ask the question, how many markers do we need to take the placenta and to say, are you born to an upper class, lower class, or middle class family? And so we found only two markers were enough and look at the R square values um, of uh, two genes that can predict uh, or tell you, <laughs> predict to the past, what status you were born. So these, I believe, will develop to very important tools in psychiatry and psychology. Because now to know what kind of um, uh, environments people had when they were young, which is a high risk predictor of things that will happen in the future, we have to ask them, did your father rape you? Uh, how many times were you beaten up? And people are not very good in answering these questions. And also, we don't want to ask these questions. And the question is, could we one day establish markers of risk? We won't ask why you had this methylation change. But if we can correlate these methylation differences with risk in the future and with ideas of intervention, uh, this will be an important field. The next story that I want to tell you about is the human evidence that that's important. In humans, it's very difficult to ask these questions. Because in humans, we cannot randomize child abuse. We have many people who were abused as children, but we don't know if their abuse was genetically predetermined because their parents had bad genes, or good genes, depends how you look at it, and or is, was it the abuse that caused those methylation changes, right? So it's very hard to dissect a cause and effect in humans. And you can, of course, apply statistical tricks um, and this is what epidemiologists have been doing for, for centuries, but you still don't know the truth. But sometimes God randomizes experiments, and they come in the way of natural disasters. 
that are randomized across the population. The Quebec ice storm of 1998 was one example. And my, my colleague, Suzanne King, uh, when this happened, um, you know, our province was hit with the greatest natural disaster in Canadian history. Um, I always say we are very lucky that this is the greatest natural disaster that we had. Uh, but um, what, was, what happened was that we got an ice storm. It's a very un unusual um, astronomic, uh, a, a f phenomena, and uh, we had ice coming on Quebec, meters of ice coming down from the sky that completely collapsed the uh, electric grid of Quebec. And in Quebec, everything goes by electricity. So all the heating, all the system were down, and the temperature was between minus 20 and minus 30. So you can, you can understand that that's a stressful event, especially when you're pregnant. And so uh, what Suzanne King did, she established a objective a measure of stress, the way social scientists do this, by looking at threat, loss, scope, and change, and followed those kids for 15 years. We're still following these kids. And they develop the three environment problems. They develop behavioral problems, very high frequency of autism. They develop uh, autoimmune issues, asthma and other ectopic diseases. And they develop cardiovascular problems. So they already have problems with sugar intolerance at much higher frequency than the rest of the population. But what we did is when they were 15 years old, we did a methylation mapping. This was done uh, with Illumina 450. And did a simple Pearson correlation uh, between their methylation pattern and the amount of stress that their mother suffered. And you can see very nicely, first, the genome-wide kind of response. This is the immune system. This is T cells. And you can see how a group of genes get less methylated and more methylated. And then ask the question, can these serve as predictors of the maternal risk? And you can see that we can take certain CGs and have a very nice correlation between the extent of methylation of that CG and the extent of stress that their mother suffered. So challenge number one is how to translate these tools to diagnostic tools that will give us an objective measure of early life stress, notwithstanding what was the stress, but uh, comparing this with risks in the future. To, in the same way that you go to your doctor and he finds out that you have 140 milli millimeter of, of, um, uh, of uh, <coughs> uh, uh, pressure, blood pressure, that it's not good for your life. And we don't know why the high blood pressure comes. What we know that is a predictor of risk and it involves certain interventions. Would we be able to use these tools as predictors, as very objective uh, predictors of risk? So this is one of the areas that I'm very interested in. This is just one example. Of course, in cancer, we're much more advanced in doing that. But I think using it um, in, the, in, the, um, in the general medicine and psychological uh, environment will be very important. And again here, when you look at the pathways that were affected by the ice storm, you see the typical usual suspects, or this is a type 1 diabetes um, pathway. And we can do mediation experiments um, to see if, so we know about these people three things. We know the amount of stress of their mother, we know the phenotype today, and we know the methylation. So we can do statistical mediation analysis and ask is the methylation of these genes mediating between the stress early in life and the phenotype later in life? So we have now uh, have published a few papers to show how these CGs mediate obesity, uh, mediate um, uh, certain uh, immu uh, immu immunological phenotypes, etc. And this data is still being analyzed using this form. So how does this work? I don't believe it goes by magic. I believe it goes through signaling pathways. And so uh, one uh, critical suspect you can have is that <coughs> the exposure causes changes in glucocorticoids, uh, and these uh, will be systemically distributed and act on genes across the system to give you either phenotype A or phenotype B. So these kind of models provide a biochemical interpretation of, of, of this data. 
Uh, you can test these models. For example, you can uh, use an animal that doesn't have a glucocorticoid receptor or has less than a glucocorticoid receptor and ask the question, will this affect the methylation pattern? So, uh, for example, here we use a animal, a transgenic mouse, that <coughs> either has two copies of the glucocorticoid receptor gene or one copy, and we'll look at the, meth oh, at the methylation pattern in the placenta and ask the question, if indeed a lot of this information is streamed through glucocorticoid receptor, if you have half a copy of glucocorticoid, or one out of two copies, glucocorticoid receptor, would your methylation pattern in the placenta be different at birth? And we designed this experiment that the mother has two copies, but it's the offspring that has one copy. So you can ask the question, is it the glucocorticoid receptor in the offspring that defines how the methylation pattern will be formed. And if we did this with and without stress, but I'm not going to show it because you can understand the mathematical complications when you have um, ANOVAs of a million sites uh, with stress, uh, gene, and sex. So we have three different things going on here. But I will just show you the interaction between sex and gene in defining the methylation pattern. So if you have two copies of uh, DNA uh, of glucocorticoid receptor and you compare males and females, there are some differences, but very small differences. If you now compare the females that had two copies versus one copies of glucocorticoid receptor, you see large differences in methylation. So blue is less methylated and, and red is more methylated. And this was defined by bisulfide sequencing. So each of these is a specific CG site. And you can see... Uh, the same differences in males, but you can see already the different, big differences between the response of males and females. In females, it's mostly loss of methylation. In males, it is mostly gain of methylation. Now you compare the males and females, and you can see vast differences in methylation. So you can see beautifully here the interaction of the glucocorticoid receptor with sex in defining what will be the output uh, of the methylation pattern in the child. So I think it, it is a first line of evidence suggesting that these signaling pathways, the stress pathways, are involved in the way uh, we eventually shape our methylation pattern. And you can imagine that having 50% of glucocorticoid receptor is very similar to having a different stress response, although it's much more easy to interpret when you knock out the gene. So this is early experiment, experience. What about late experience? Uh, does it stop at birth? And so one of the interesting experiences that a person can suffer is injury. And that sometimes develops what we call chronic pain. So years after you had the injury, you suffer from chronic pain. And chronic pain is a major problem, ma major medical problem that we have no solution for. Is it possible that the exposure to injury causes changes in methylation that will cause chronic pain? Another experience that adult experience is taking drugs and developing addiction. So you take drugs and you develop addiction and it stays with you for life. Are these also working, operating by the same parameters that I showed you before? And here, of course, you can ask the question not only of knowing who is addicted and who is not um, using diagnostic tools, but here can we use therapeutic concepts uh, to change that. So what we did is, uh, in this experiment, we gained now, looked at T-cells, uh, although, of course, uh, looking at T-cells uh, uh, is not an obvious place to look for chronic pain. So in rats, we can also look at the prefrontal cortex. But the reason why we looked in T-cells is because if we want to translate it to humans, if we want to understand, after the doctor made an operation, who of the patients will develop chronic pain and who will not, uh, we are not going to take parts of their brain. And it is a very a hard education for me to teach my psychiatrist to realize that the brain is not floating on air and that it's connected with, with other tissues that can provide important information that you can use. So in this case, we looked at animals that went through an an operation, a sciatic nerve injury, 
nine months after the injury, and they develop chronic pain, um, and you can measure it in rats by subjecting them to sensitivity to pain, different forms of pain, either temperature or physical pressure. And you look at the methylome, so the sham are the controls, and the SNI are the, are the uh, injured. And you can see a very huge difference in methylation, interestingly, in the prefrontal cortex as well as in T cells. So we see that the animal registers, I had an operation, and it says nine months in the rat is probably equal to 10 to 15 years in the human, years down the line. You can look at a methylation pattern, not only in the brain where you would expect it, but also uh, in, a, in the immune system. You can also start understanding what is activated here. And one of the top pathways that, so of course you get glucocorticoid receptor signaling, which doesn't surprise you. Um, an injury is a traumatic uh, stress uh, event. But you also get NF-kappa beta, um, which is a typical um, a, um, inflammatory response that stays for essentially years in the system uh, that can guide you now about using it as a diagnostic. So we did the same trick. We asked, pain could be measured and could be scaled. DNA methylation could be scaled. That's the beauty of DNA methylation. You get a scale between 0 and 100. And it could be 0, 0, 1, depends on your sensitivity, to 100. So you get a full scale of DNA methylation. With pain, we can't get such a sensitive scale, but we can get a scale. And we can see, do methylation events in T cells predict the pain, the sensitivity, not the pain, but the sensitivity to pain. And you can see that we, when we perform a penalized regression, we can find markers that work extremely well as predictors of pain in the immune system. So another aspect of my lab, we're trying to build now the proper collaboration with, with money, uh, because all of this takes money to translate from these ideas to a tool that you can use in the clinic. And so we're negotiating with some uh, companies that are interested in developing uh, you know, diagnostic markers of chronic pain, which as I said, is a major medical problem. I'm running out of time. Um, so I'll skip the, this story, and I'll just go to the last story. Uh, cocaine is another interesting experiment that many of us experience or our friends experience sometime in our uh, growing up. And usually the experience happens like this. You're in high school, and somebody, you go to a party, and there's some drugs going on there, and you take drugs. Then nothing really happens. You get happy and you forget about it. And then months down the line, somebody, a pusher, uh, will, will come to your high school or university and try to push drugs to you. And then what will happen is 30% of people will become addicted, and others can co take cocaine you know, whenever, and they're never addicted to it. So already we see there is some sort of a difference in the population in becoming addicted. You know, for example, you know, Zyg Zygmunt Freud uh, used cocaine as a major tool in his work. He promoted it till he had one of his physicians who committed suicide, and then he realized that cocaine is not always good. But for him, it was great. And you can see the letters he writes his wife about the, greatest, the great advantages of cocaine. And at the time, cocaine was considered the most important tool. You know, Coca-Cola was introduced into factories in the United States because the managers dis they discovered that if they have taps of Coca-Cola in their factories, workers never want to go home. So they would drink Coca-Cola. And uh, so cocaine can have some positive effects. In most people, probably would not cause any addiction. But in a segment of the population, it would be devastating. What's interesting is the same in animals. So when you expose rats, to this paradigm. So you first teach them how to self-administer cocaine for some time, and then you withdraw them from cocaine. You send them to a rehab uh, or uh, no cocaine around. They don't see any cocaine. And then you reintroduce the cue. So you don't need to give them cocaine. You just show them the party where they got the first cocaine. And when they see the lights of the party, they will start pressing the lever. Even though there's no cocaine coming out of the lever, they will press and press and press till they shake the cage and die. 
So they can press and press. But only 30% of the animals will do that. The others will not, even though they're genetically identical. So we asked a number of questions. Is first, is there an epigenetic registry of this experience? So does the brain adopt the genome to a life with cocaine? And I look at it as an adaptation. You know, when you get cocaine, you change neurotransmitter signaling. It's a new world there. You need a new epigenome to deal with it. And what happens in the rehab when they don't get cocaine? And this is even more interesting because there's no chemicals there. It's just the fact that they had cocaine in the past and they don't have it now. It's a behavioral situation. And then what happens when you give them the cure? And what we found was um, dramatic uh, methylation changes happening. Uh, these are candidate genes all known to be involved in addiction during all these periods of times. But the biggest changes in DNA methylation and gene transcription, uh, because we did also a full transcriptome, full methylome analysis, happens during rehab. And by the way, this is the only treatment that exists now in the world for addiction. Everybody knows it doesn't work, but everybody administers it, because that's what's happening in the behavioral world. Uh, evidence is not very important in defining what kind of interventions you're going to use. And so in the animals, what rehab does, it makes them 10 times more addicted than they were before rehab. And now we know what's going on. During rehab, the biggest changes in transcription and methylation happen during the time that they don't get the cocaine. And then you give them the cue, and within one hour, we get also dramatic changes in methylation. So now the question is, what do you do with this information? So I come from the field of pharmacology, so we always want to use drugs to treat drugs. And, uh, and so we asked the question, can we use the same toys that I used in cancer uh, to, uh, to do that? So essentially, uh, I missed uh, one of the figures that I wanted to show you. This is because I wanted to tell you another story. But in, a, in any case, if we look at a gene as a some form of a steady state that is defined by enzymes that either methylate or demethylate, theoretically, we can reverse a situation that we don't like, like phenotype B that is caused by methylation of certain genes, to phenotype A, which we like. So in this case, in the case of cancer, we want to reverse a tumor suppressor to a non-tumor suppressor. In the case of addiction, can we use epigenetic drugs to reverse the way the epigenome works? Of course, if you uh, use a normal uh, reason, you would say this cannot work, right? Because I just showed you. Thousands of genes are changing methylation pattern uh, during the rehab. And, and hundreds of genes are changing methylation patterns during the cure. So how on earth do you dare to use such a dirty approach, which is to use a general methylation inhibitor or, or general methylation stimulator uh, to change the system, right? So it doesn't make any sense. And of course, um, this hasn't escaped the attention of reviewers who would immediately tell you that that should not work. But, you know, in science, the beauty of science, in difference from religion, is that we don't care about the dogmas, we care about the data, or we should care about the data. And the next thing about, about science, which I would recommend, is approach science with a little level of ignorance and a level of humility, which comes with ignorance, which means I don't know everything. Maybe it will work, and it's worth it if it works. So um, we then decided how to treat. You can treat at different times. You can treat immediately after they were exposed to cocaine. You can treat during rehab, or you can treat during the cure. And we found that, just to, not to show you all the data, that the best response we get is during the cure. And we can talk about why. But if we treat immediately after injection, you get no impact on their addiction. It doesn't do anything. So you would think it should work. I, they just were exposed to the chemical, and I treat them with a methylase inhibitor. But if you treat after long withdrawal, after rehab, 
and you give them the cue, then you get a very strong effect using uh, RG108, which is a DNA methylase inhibitor that works in the brain. And what's interesting is we treat it once, and after 60 days, the animals are still less addicted. And that's the power of epigenetic therapy, because if you remember what I was trying to say, the exposure creates a certain change in methylation. If you remove that, this is not going to come back unless you have a different exposure. So epigenetic approaches can create cure rather than symptomatic relief. And so these animals, 60 days in an animal is like a few years in a human, so it's a very long time. When you treat with the opposite drug, with methionine that stimulates DNA methylation, you get hyperaddiction. These animals just rattle the cage. They can, you cannot stop their addictive uh, personality. And again, it stays for a long time. So I believe that the pairing, it's not just I believe, but we did the methylation analysis to show that, that when you pair the treatment with the cue, what the, we have to understand that drugs don't methylate or demethylate. Enzymes methylate or demethylate. Enzymes don't sit on genes just like this. There is a reason why they sit on genes. The genome is a very big place, and for enzymes to go to particular genes so that your drug can methylate or demethylate, there's a lot of physiology has to happen to do that. When you do the Q, you open up the system. You send the enzymes to the genes. And this is the best time where you can get specificity because you have created that specificity by changing the landscape of the methylone with your environment. So what we want to do in this case is to pair a drug therapy and a psychotherapy. So psychologists know how to reenact, and they're actually using it a lot in what's called cognitive behavioral therapy, is to reenact the event, showing pictures from the party, for example or movie from a party where cocaine is being given. This is a cue that can elicit those pathways and then give the drug with it. So this is the kind of strategy that we're going to use. But you can do something else. You can look at the methylone and how it behaves to guess whether there are other targets in the system. So methylome analysis provides you two levels of information. First, to know that there was an epigenetic difference, so I should interfere with an epigenetic drug. But also, you know which genes were changed. And that gives you an idea what are the targets that you should target. So what we saw when we analyzed all the experiments, we analyzed you know, what changes with rehab and what is cured with the epigenetic therapy. We found a few genes that stood up. One of them was the estrogen receptor, one, that got demethylated with the cocaine um, induction. So we assumed that the expression of the gene goes up. So in this case, uh, we needed to use an agony. Uh, actually, the, the demethylation happened with the treatment. So we know that if we want to recapitulate the treatment, we need to activate that gene. And as pharmacologists, we know how to do it. We use an agonist of estrogen receptor. By the way, this taps into the male female differences that you can understand it might have some biological reason. And the other gene that we found is a cycling, uh, cycling dependent kinase number five. Here we had a demethylation in the body of the gene which caused a repression of the gene. So in this case we should use an antagonist to cure the addiction. And that is very important because that shows that what we do with the methylation analysis is real because our hypothesis is methylation changes expression of certain genes that are critical for the addictive personality. So if we can find those genes by methylation analysis and treat those genes, we don't only get new treatments, but we get validation to a certain extent of our hypothesis. And we got remarkable results when we treated either with an ESR1 agonist or with a CTK5 inhibitors, and we got dramatic inhibition of the addiction. So epigenetics can provide us therapeutic information at two levels. First, by using epigenetic, like, you know, uh, um, shock therapy uh, to rearrange the epigenome, and by identifying critical targets that could be targeted by some known drugs. And the beauty of this system is these drugs are known, approved by the FDA, and we can go straight and do a clinical translational study with this. And we have now similar stories with PTSD that I'm very excited about. 
and this is a collaboration. Both of these are collaborations with a scientist in Israel, Gal Yadid. And uh, now we are hoping to translate it to uh, very fast to clinical practice because we can go to the IRB and say these drugs are approved uh, for other uses and uh, we can start seeing if they work. But I think the other exciting is aspect, all these drugs only work if you pair it with psychotherapy. And so in the, in the rat, the psychotherapy is giving him the cue of, of whatever event it was. In humans, we believe we can use uh, also combination. So the idea is to pair psychotherapy uh, with epigenetic therapy or drug, epigenetic target drug therapy. So this is uh, the end of my talk. I, had, I always want to tell more things that I can tell. Um, uh, even though I have a rule, uh, one minute per slide, but it doesn't work anymore. It used to work when I was younger. Uh, I love my slides more now, so I speak more than a minute on a slide. And, uh, but I think the approach to diagnosis and therapeutic potential of epigenetics, which I think is huge, is completely untapped as, and has an infinite capacity. And you can think about almost every human condition that has some epigenetic component, and you can now extend it to the fish and the fowl and, and the bacteria and et cetera. And epigenetic approaches can really exponentially expand our toolbox of diagnostic and um, therapeutic tools. But also it's derived from a thorough theoretical understanding of how disease is emerging. So you tap into the theoretical basis of it rather than to you know, external symptoms. So the idea behind this whole thing is that our genome is breathing the environment and responding to the environment. And that response is organized. It's not random. And that response, of course, I'm not talking about random in a theoretical way. It is probably has a random component that was selected, but today it's predictable. You pre can predict the response, and you can predict which pathways are involved in this response. And that creates a phenotype. And that phenotype, you can also understand why it was created. So cocaine is useful for a lot of people. For Sigmund Freud, it was the greatest drive. So his epigenome adaptation to cocaine was amazing. It created a whole new field in medicine and, and, and science. But for some people, it's not. And it gives you a real look at you know, the same environmental interaction causes a response which in probably most animals of the species will be a positive response and adaptation. In a few, it will be maladaptation. And the next element is that this dialogue doesn't stop at birth. It doesn't stop in the womb. When I was a graduate student, development was the first days after conception. Uh, later, it expanded to the entire pregnancy. And then I realized that for a psychologist, development really starts when the child is one year old. And so what psychologists and pediatricians call developmental and what a molecular biologist called developmental was totally different. And you can just open journals that have development in them. Open gene and development. It has nothing after birth. Nothing, I promise you, even today. Everything is the early you know, um, uh, division of blastocysts and things like that. And if you open a psychology journal, it has nothing that happens before birth, and everything is after birth. But I would suggest that development starts at birth and continues a long time, as I showed you with the monkeys, but never stops till you die. And there's a lot of evidence that there are big, massive epigenetic changes, for example, during aging, during puberty. And the epigenome keeps breathing the environment. The epigenome keeps talking to the environment. And the consequence of that dialogue is a new epigenome. So the two rats that come to the cocaine are coming with a different epigenome. Even though we raise them in a cage, we know very well they're not exactly the same epigenetically. And when they come to that, they now respond to this with an epigenetic change. But the two rats will come with a different epigenome out of, out of this encounter. And that will prepare, that will also predetermine to a certain extent their next encounter. So what we're dealing with is a movie rather than a simple script and a movie with interactive players that you can move the mother from the movie and the movie is changing. 
So it's not the same methylation changes that happen when you remove the mother that will happen in two years. You just removed one actor. One lover of the mother is gone, and the entire soap opera is going to behave differently, right? So we can think about it as a series of soap operas where you precautiously remove certain actors from the scene, and the entire scene is going to be evolving differently. So this is a dynamic approach at the genome. The genome is not a static thing. It's a continuously um, dialoguing with the environment. And this gives us a concept of both well-being as well as disease. These dialogues can result in disease when the dialogues end in some sort of a mismatch. And I believe that every human disease could be understood as some sort of adaptation that uh, uses normal physiological processes that eventually becomes maladaptive. So this is the summary of what I wanted to tell you. This is enormous number of people that I collaborated with. Um, the last story was with a collaboration from Gali Hadid. Uh, Suzanne King is the ice storm story, and Steve Sumi is the monkey story. And of course, uh, the important thing is the Peter Gass is the glucocorticoid with Michaela Schmidt, the methyl group, which never stopped to amaze me. Uh, philosophically, it's such an amazing creature that is in the boundaries between predetermined and freedom of will. Uh, you know, the, there is a rabbinical statement that says everything is predetermined, but you have freedom of will. And, um, and, and so this is a very difficult um, statement to understand. But this is how DNA methylation works. It's kind of predetermined, but there is some freedom of will. Um, there's windows of opportunity there that we who are interested in applying science to the world uh, can take advantage of. And this is the beauty of, of the methylation pattern. The strongest bond in nature, at the same time, one of the most dynamic uh, creatures. And of course, thanks to all the granting agencies that I keep lying to uh, for three decades. Thank you. Uh, we, have, we, have, we have time for one or two questions. Amir. Unfortunately, uh, with rats, it's impossible because it's impossible to draw you know, a sufficient amount of blood with rat, from rats without killing them. Um, so we can do epigenetic analysis, although it should be theoretically possible. Uh, this will be probably easier to do with monkeys and with humans. Um, in, but what we have with rats is the brain, which we don't have with monkeys and humans. Of course, we won't get their brain, so we need to see. So we already started a study. Uh, again, with Galia Deed, where we're looking at T cells of humans. Um, but to do a predictive study, we need to do at the entire population. So I actually had a scientist from Egypt who proposed me to do that, and it was the strangest place where you would think to do alcoholism research. And she told me that in Egyptian high schools, alcoholism is rampant. And you almost know when it will happen, at what age. And if you can do a metalome of all the kids in the high school before uh, before they become addicted, and then after they have the encounter with ethanol. And she came to me, and I looked at her, yeah, but you're living in a Muslim country where alcohol is prohibited. But she told me also Jews are not supposed to eat pork, but a lot of Jews eat pork. So uh, I understood that, uh, you know, religious, uh, religious things don't... So this is the only way to do it. And actually, there are places, American high schools for sure, you can predict how many people will become addicted from a high school. And you can actually know what is the age usually when they become addicted, and you can do that. It's not a simple experiment. Do you see correlation with the attacks that you were referring to in the monkeys? Yes. So in the monkeys, the caste will predict it. In the humans, also the caste will predict it. So we know that you know, lower class will tend to be more addicted than higher class. Yeah. Pascal, Pascal, Pascal. Yes. 
That's, I think it's the story about the rats, the 30% of the rats that become addicted or not, yeah. is fascinating. And um, dealing for us with domestic animals that have been selected, so we have animals that have been selected for such and such production, how much is the genetic background influencing that epigenome that is going to influence the response to, to the treatment or whatever stimulus? No, I'm sure the, epi the genetic background will have a huge impact, right? Uh, because it will define, uh, you know, the quality of the methylation enzymes, the sequences that could be modified. Uh, and so on different strains, you will get different percentage of addiction. So, I mean, if we are really staying into the animal production right. thought, could you, because the, the main way that we select animals is by genetic selection. Right. And so maybe one of the ways would be to associate genetic selection for response to epigenetic yes. uh, stimulus, as well as using those epigenetic stimulus to stimulate the phenotype that we want. Of course, of course. I think this is very, a very interesting you know, experimental strategy to create, to look at genes versus everything. And like what we did here with the mutation of glucocorticoid receptor, and now apply stress to that group and mm -hmm. see how you know, this change will apply. Everybody uses identical twins. Um, we, I, my name is on a few papers with identical twins, but I haven't contributed much to it. I personally am not excited about identical twins because they are an aber aberration, right? So, you know... But in terms of response... But of course, when you look at... So there are a number of studies that show that non-identical phenotypes in identical genomes uh, have probably an epigenetic association. For example, in, there are you know, discordance in AD, discordance in, um, in schizophrenia, uh, cases where... But the problem with these studies is the ends. Methylation. Methylation, yeah. So people looked at methylation. So these are not respond... You know, with humans, it's very hard to do responses because you, you, have to, you have to design a randomized control environment for twins. It's kind of uh, not a very ethical thing to do. But what you can do with humans is humans who have discordant to certain phenotypes and ask the question, is their epigenome different? The only problem is always N of 1. And, um, you know, so the, the power, on one hand, you have genetic, relatively clean background. On the other hand, you have very small numbers. So there is evidence from twins that discordance is connected to methylation changes. How strong this evidence is, is a big question because of the, of the size of the population, yeah. Oh, is the last question here, yeah. Changes within the same cell versus, say, possibility for differential expansion of different types of cells, or affecting the differentiation of uh, progenital cells in a, in a way which is which depends on uh, experience. Oh, yeah. cool. right. So this is very difficult to tease apart. This is very, very difficult because different cells have different methods. So you don't know if it's subculture. No, you can do that. That's not the problem. The problem is what happens in life. Uh, working with the brain is a bit different because in the brain, especially you know, when you look at neurons from the prefrontal cortex, there's very little cell division or differentiation that goes, that we know of. And so we assume that most of these changes are, um, are in the same cell. In, in, in culture, you know, I've shown last time that if we take hippocampal neurons that don't divide, within two, two hours, uh, we can get this kind of changes, right? So you can mimic it in, in culture. But in the end, probably it's a combination of changing fate of cells and changing the methylation of cells within the same fate. Last question. Oh. Uh, I, very interesting uh, presentation. And, but it seems that there is a lot of signals from the environment that are get imprinted. Mm -hmm. So in real life, when somebody goes, there are a lot of changes because of many different experiences. So, it's one thing when you do it in a condition of a lab where you could isolate, but it seems that if the, all those changes accumulate, you have such a level of noise.
can you really use it as a diagnostic at that stage? So that's a question of, of uh, empirical testing, right? So, you know, once you move from the theory to practice, the question is how good it is and how good it is versus other things we have. And, you know, I think if we have indications that it's very good. And I really, you know, as a tool, it's not that important uh, what caused that methylation change. What is important is how good a predictor it is of risk that you care about. And if it becomes a good predictor, then it's a good predictor, right? So, uh, uh, you know, the same with high blood pressure or high LDL and low HDL. We don't know, really. There might be a thousand mechanisms that lead to these differences. But it's a very good predictor of trouble later in life. So I think for the diagnostic point of view, and if you are in the animal field, you want to know if you have a set of diagnostic tools that tell you about do I have a large risk in this environment to lose a good fraction of my fish or not, whether it came from you know, different, different reasons or not. So this is the difference between predictors and theory. Theoretically, I think it's very difficult to do experiments in humans. I think there's very little data in humans that is proven. Uh, because of all the issues that, because we can't put humans in cages and, you know, control environments, and these issues are, are horrendous. I think numbers in humans is a major issue, and, and that confounds it. So we need to use animals to teach us about humans. And then, if I take IL-6 change in methylation in animals, where I control the environment, and I can see the same in humans, or in a species where I'm working on the wild rather than in a cage, I think it's a, good, it's a good chance that this will be good, and then, of course, it has to be tested. It has to be tested. Does it work? Yeah. No, no, okay, so there are two, there are two possibilities here, and, and if you look at the literature, including our own, both are true. One possibility is that change is in a general mechanism, but that will not create the specificity. The specificity has to be created by transcription factors that recognize specific genes, and the matrix of transcription factor that exists when the intervention happens. So it's not so important how much methylase you have in the cell. What's important is to get the methylase to the right target. And that, I don't think the amount of methylase is limited. So I think we have enough methylase, even in a normal condition, to change everything. And the reason why it doesn't change everything is because it doesn't get there. Uh, the genome is a very, very big place. And, and it's like sending a letter to a country, say, sending a letter to John in the United States. You know, it will never get there. And the way the letter gets to John in the United States is through zip codes. And so the, I think the important players are the readers of the zip code. They are highly regulated by signaling pathways. And so there is a matrix of signaling that I think is critical, not the amount of enzyme. I think it's futile uh, to look at the amount of enzyme, as, you know, the general enzyme as, um, as a real predictor of you know, what will be the specific changes. Having 
just like so. In the drop that you are looking at the thing that is there, do you see any of them that by any chance you can use giving them notes or your option or so and sell it to the society saying that this would make your baby better or make a okay, better cause or anything? Is there anything in the pipeline that you acknowledge that you can maybe use and we don't have that side of it? So First, the side effects of epigenetic drugs are very mild relative to other drugs. And so, uh, you know, every drug has side effects, but if you compare it to other drugs, definitely to drugs that are used commonly, you know, in practice, like, like steroids, or, um, you know, uh, or um, aspirin, or, uh, you know, and so I think the, the, but the side effect during development will be quite huge because it affects development. But having said that, there is a Darth, there is very few, there are very few epigenetic drugs. And the reason is because we didn't try to produce them. I started a company to develop new epigenetic drugs. And when we raised $150 million, the, uh, the leaders of the company said, we have so much money, why should we take risk? So we can now start buying drugs. And what they did is started buying drugs. And so there is a general problem in the field of new drug there are very few new drugs in general. And 99% of molecular biology was not translated to real drugs. This is an unfortunate situation. It's shameful that we're still using azacitidine that was invented in Czechoslovakia in 1958. And we haven't developed any new drugs against methylation. And the reason is we didn't try. And I know about many drug companies that tried. It didn't work the first time. And they just abandoned it because it's too risky. So I think what we need, you're right, we need drugs. A lot of these side effects have nothing to do with the epigenetic side effects. It has to do with the chemical, as with many drugs. We definitely need a large effort in the field uh, to develop these drugs. It's starting now. People are getting interest. People all are talking about how important epigenetics is. But if you go to real companies and ask how many of them are investing you know, in developing epigenetic drugs, there's very, very few. And it has to do with the risk averse they're all sitting on tons of cash, and when you have so much cash, you're afraid of losing it. So it's better for you just to buy another SSRI or another drug that you know how it works, change a metal group here and a hydroxyl there, get a patent, fly the, uh, the doctors to, some, to Thailand, provide them with young, nice women, and then convince them to administer it as a drug. This is the major sickness of, of the field, and you're just pointing to... It's a shame that you found two drugs, and, but I admit this is the case.